Hey everyone, I'm Suzanne. Today we're going to talk about a basic intro to computer vision tasks and the uh, highest level of a PyTorch neural network and some architectures that are used for those common computer vision tasks. So let's get into it. Okay, so first we're, yes, first we're going to talk about machine learning at the highest level, then we're going to talk about the tasks, then we're going to talk about each of the architectures. Um, okay, so in machine learning, you have a machine and a teacher, and that teacher is comprised of data and an expert. And the expert is there usually to label that data. Um, so you have, in our case, images and labels on those images, whatever they may be, and you feed those into a model. Um, and we'll get more into, we'll get more into the, what, entirely this uh, depiction means. And then that model gives back predictions and then um, the expert can compare those predictions with their labels and see how well the model did. Uh, yeah, and so this model, um, what goes in is your data and what comes out are predictions. And typically these are referenced as X and Y. Um, and this is what we mean by where what comes out and this is what we, what we mean by what goes in. And examples of what could go in for general machine learning models are images. So say, uh, say we're trying to classify M&M in a variety of situations. So we could pass in images of M&M. We could pass in videos, which are just frames, many frames of images of an M&M concert. Um, we could pass in audio data. So it doesn't have to be two channel, like, multi-channel, um, it could be single channel, uh, and, or it could be text. Um, so like lyrics that an Eminem song has, has made. And then for each of those examples, the output could be for the image of Eminem, it could be categorizing that this is an image of Eminem. For the video, it could be um, an action behavior. So Eminem in concert or Eminem singing. Um, for the audio, it could be a classification of what song the audio is, um, in our case, it was Lose Yourself. And then for text, it could be an answer to the prompt that was created. So ch like ChatGPT, you, you can ask it a question and it'll come out with an answer. And yeah, so the way that it does this is usually by a loss function. So um, so it's it's super iterative. Um, you pass in some training data um, into a model, it creates a prediction, and then the loss function um, comes up with a score between the actual um, label, the ground truth label, and what the model predicted. And uh, there, are, like all of the data gets passed over many times. Uh, each time that a full set of data is, is run through is called an epoch. Uh, and a model runs for um, a predefined number of epochs. Usually it's configurable. Um, and each epoch, the model will try to make the loss between the predictions and the ground truth smaller. And then at the end, when you come up with um, a model that does reasonably well with training data, uh, and then with that loss, um, you freeze that, that model and you say, okay, this is my best, this is the best model that I've come up with. And then you use that model to then generate predictions without training. So this is called inference. So when you pass um, a model, some data, and then it comes out with a prediction, that's the process called inference. Okay, let's get into some of the computer vision tasks. Um, so we'll talk about classification, we'll go into localization, particularly focusing on bounding box detection, um, and then we'll go into tracking. So classification, oh, wait. Okay, yeah, so this is, so this could be a classification task. It could be, this is a scene of a kitchen. Um, this is a bounding box task where each object has a box around it. Um, this is a segmentation task um, where each object each individual object is um, it, like, it's more granular than the box. It has what 
exactly what pixels are part of which object. Um, this is pose estimation. So humans have different poses, they move around um, and certain tasks try to capture those poses. Uh, and then I think that this is 3D. So it tries to capture um, not only like in 2D space where an object is, but also an extra Z coordinate. And then this is the task of tracking. So not only does it capture um, bounding boxes around each object, it only captures also moving objects, um, but also it keeps um, keeps a number, which is like an ID with each object to say this is the same thing over many frames. Okay, so let's focus on classification first. Um, so yeah, so you feed in an image in our case um, into a particularly defined classification model and then out comes a uh, description of what that is. Yeah. Uh, it describes what, given usually a fixed size input. Um, so you say it can be any any of these n classes, where n could be a dog, a cat, a human, M and M, um, a kitchen. It's on the order of computer vision tasks, relatively easy to evaluate, although several problems are still very hard. Um, and it's simple to train when the data is balanced. Um, in object detection, so these are our four examples, but we're going to focus on bounding box detection. Um, so it tells you how many objects there are, or how many objects it finds in the image, um, what those objects are, as well as where they are. So it gives x, y coordinates, usually, and width and height. Um, comparing these two, uh, Object detection is kind of like another step after classification. Uh, instead of having, because you can have an infinite number of objects in an image, or you could have zero objects, or you could have one object. So it's um, an like unbounded number of outputs. Um, it has slightly more complex training because of that. And the design of the model needs to be a little bit more specialized. Uh, yeah, so it gives however many objects that it finds in the image, which is a set of bounding boxes, a category per box, which is um, back to your classification problem. So it could be um, any N defined categories, um, or it could be an unknown category if you want that to be a category. And then it usually gives a confident score per box. So if it's really confident that some object exists there, it'll be closer to one. If it's um, moderately unconfident, it would either be close to zero or 4.5, depending on what your model looks like. And yeah, it's a little bit trickier to evaluate the outputs because you ne need to say what, you need to evaluate based on what it says and where it says it. So if it gives the exactly correct bounding box, but it says it's a dog instead of a hyena, or if it gives, it's a fly instead of a bumblebee, um, it's a little bit up to you to say how wrong that like class difference prediction is. Um, and then also if it gives the right, if it gives a wrong or right class, but then gets the box slightly off, um, you need to say, you need to specify at what um, threshold or level of, deviation are you okay with? Um, and yeah, ground truth, ground truths and predictions are nearly never like exactly the same. So it's very rare that you have exact bounding box uh, overlap. Um, and that's in part because if you think about it, if you if you label an image and you say, okay, I think it has this bounding box and then your friend labels an image and they, they say, okay, it has this bounding box. Those two lab labels, even though they're the same, Will be slightly off. Um, so that's a good, um, if you want to like calibrate how uh, accurate you want your model to be in terms of localizing, that's a good way to, to do it. Okay, so some difficulties with object detection are invariance, equivariance, and imbalance. So invariance is when you transform for us an image in a certain way, uh, and it's the same thing. It's just 
usually the localization changes um, in a certain way. So you have a cat um, and then you can rotate it or shift it in a way that it's the same cat, but in a different position. You could also do this with like manipulating the pixel space. So if you make it grayscale or it's like any function applied to the original image um, that changes it in some way and makes the detection more challenging. So yeah, these are both cat. Um, image classification would stay the same because it would still say that this is the pic this is a picture of a cat, but detection because of the localization part needs to be a little bit more rigorous. And then, yeah, so you can change the pixel values and um, the output should stay the same, although it might like have challenges with that. Um, and yeah, so this is another, this is like a more less, a less of a toy example. These are all chairs. They should all have bounding boxes, but you can see that they're all um, very different. And this is called intra-class variation. So like you could have several different appearances of a chair. You could have several different, like all dogs look different because they're not all golden retrievers, um, but your model should still be able to recognize, okay, this is a dog or, or whatnot. Okay, equivariance is um, like applying several uh, functions to an image so or doing those functions the other way around. So it's a little bit easier to explain with um, this diagram. Uh, so yeah, either you can apply this map, which changes the location and then this map, which changes the image space, or you can apply this match, which first changes the image space and this map, which then changes the location. They both get to the same thing. Um, and yeah, your model should be uh, able to, to adjust to those things. Here are just some more examples. Um, I'm not gonna get into this in too much detail. Okay, and then imbalance is a problem that probably several of you uh, are trying to grapple with. Um, it's when you have, it's the problem of uh, your object, your image could have zero objects or your object image could have a few objects or your image could have thousands and like several hundred objects. Um, and then when, creating training batches, you don't want all of your training data to have zero images and then all of your test data um, to have, or sorry, to have zero objects in your image and all of your test data to have several hundreds of objects in your image because your model will learn that your data is sparse when it's actually not. Um, and then you also uh, want to be careful what you label um, because your model will learn that whatever is not labeled is background um, but then you might have something in the background that it like sees later and picks up on uh, and yeah all of this is to say that machine learning models really struggle when data is highly imbalanced so you want to try as hard as you can to make it as balanced as possible um, but yeah that this is a common um challenge, especially in ecology data. Okay, and then tracking is kind of like, we ha we first had classification, then we had detection, which built on top of, top of classification. And object tra tracking is just adding another layer of complexity to detection um, by associating, like, keeping time in, in to account and re-identifying re every object that was detected across frames. So yeah, so not only do you get um, an object, you get uh, an identifiable object and its location and which frame that it's in. Um, so what, where, um, and space and time. And yeah, so tracking tends to be more difficult than detection, which tends to be more difficult than classification in terms of complexity. Okay, um, so now we're gonna jump into architectures. Um, the goal is to talk about neural, like 
PyTorch architectures and neural network architectures related to each of the tasks, classification, detection, and tracking. But first, I wanted to uh, give a little bit of background on what a neural network is, um, kind of what deep learning is um, at just the basic level with some additional resources in the slides. OK, so this is this is just a, a copied slide from Stanford's CS231N uh, class. Um, it's giving a visual representation of what a network is actually doing. So if you feed in an image of a plane, um, it's trying to predict uh, like what the image is. So this is a classification task. Um, so in, in our case, it's a it's an airplane and it gives these levels of confidence. So it says, I think this is an airplane with 0.6 confidence. I think that this is a ship with 0.4 confidence or 0.3 confidence. And then cat, bird, and deer are, are all very low. Um, and then these middle layers are all showing kind of what the network sees as it goes along and then what information is being um, passed to other other layers. And I'll get more into this jargon and not not this, not the con value pool stuff, um, but more into like what is a layer, what is a node, um, what is it doing between layers in a, in a little bit. So yeah, so let's say that we have a classification problem and they're all pictures of dogs, cat, and mice. Um, and then take note that this mouse looks very different than this mouse, even though it should be able to classify them as the same, looks very different than this mouse. This dog looks very different from this dog, looks different from this dog, and so on. Um, these are called samples. So this is our like X data set. Um, and then these all are called labels. Remember those were Y. Um, so in PyTorch, PyTorch has a built-in data set class. Um, so a data set takes in like the file paths to your data and then also um, the file paths to your labels um, or however you want to parse those if they're separate um, or however you want to parse those if they're together uh, and then turns them into Torch tensors. So every um, sample will have a label and a Data, data point associated with it. Um, and then this is also where PyTorch does augmentations. So if you wanna, so if you say, okay, flip every image and make that a separate image or um, resize images or um, add noise to an image, um, it will create additional images that um, have those augmentations. So augmentations will augment your data set rather than just um, changing one image or to be whatever its augmented version is. So yeah, this is what it will look like um, kind of in code. It'll be a file path to your image and then whatever label it has. And then a tensor's shape is usually the number of channels, the image height, and the image width, um, where the number of channels in an RGB image is usually three. Um, I mean, it's always three. Um, the number of channels in a grayscale image is one. Um, and then the number of channels for multispectral imagery uh, is typically greater than three. That's fine, though it's difficult to visualize. Um, so just be aware of that. And then um, a torch tensor plus the label is usually just like the number of channels. So three in our example case the image height, the image width, and then the label. So the label is usually converted, usually a map um, from a string um, to a number. And so the number can be in the torch tensor. Okay. So then PyTorch also has a data loader, which is what creates batch batches of data from the data set. So the data set is just like rows and rows and rows of torch tensors with data X and your label Y. And your data loader um, takes your data set, which is here, and then takes a specified batch size, um, which you usually set in a config. So say our batch size is six. And then it you tell the data loader to either shuffle all of your data. So to make these all have a different um, 
index uh, or not. And then your num worker num workers is um, either the number of yeah, it's the number of CPU cores that are um, used to, to load this data. Um, and just for a note, batch size um, usually affects like how quick uh, your model can get through all of your data. Because if if your model is loading batches one by one, um, it's like f that's fine, um, but it's not parallelizing a whole lot. Um, but if your model, so like a general rule of thumb is to see where, like what batch, what batch size um, you can't load anymore. Like your your operating system struggles to load or or runs into a memory fault. Um, and then produce that by a little bit um, and make that your batch size so that you're you're maxing out what your computer can do for you. And then you can finish in, in theory earlier. Okay, so your data loader creates batches from the data set. And so this is what that kind of looks like in code. Um, it'll, so it'll spit out train features, which are those torch tensors. Um, remember those are like um, uh, number of channels, image high, image width, and then your train labels, which are like zero, one, two, based on if it's a dog, cat, or a mouse. Um, and then it'll, it'll spit out however many of them is in a batch size every time you iterate through it. Uh, so yeah, so this looks like six cause six was our batch size, three image height, image width. And this is six and one because your label is just a single label. Um, and there are six of them per, per batch. And then, yeah. Uh, an epoch, um, as I mentioned, was when you go through a full pass of all of your data. Um, so one epoch in our case is three batches. Um, also, so just a little bit more jargon. A bat when it goes through a batch, it's usually called an iteration. Um, so however many batches, um, like you could have however many iterations um, divided by your number of batches would be your however many epochs you have. That's okay. You don't, yeah. But an epoch is just like one full pass. It's seen all of the data um, in your data split. Okay. So next we're going to get into this like neural network architecture. But first, uh, I remember at the beginning of this lecture, I said that I was going to get into kind of what this diagram was. And so now I'm going to get into it. So, okay, so we all remember from um, like secondary school math that y equals mx plus b and m is the slope and b is the intercept. So we can think about this as um, sort of an extrapolation of this equation. Um, m in this case, m and b are what are called weights um, and they're just ways to tell your output, how much um, emphasis should be placed on each data point X. Um, so if you want to say, if this is, you know, M times X1 plus N times X2 plus B, um, that and your X2 parameter matters a whole lot more than your X1 parameter, you're going to want to weigh that X2 um, parameter more than your x1 parameter. So that's, that's how weights comes to be a term, but you can think about it as just like um, coefficients that multiply your your data terms. Um, so like going a step into, so we don't deal with li linear cases um, or just we don't deal with rather cases that are this simple usually. Um, but we do deal with several, several matrix multiplications, um, which have many of those like x1, x2, x3, x4, and so on terms. Um, and so in this case, you, it can be expressed as a matrix, um, but M as a matrix and B are still your weights. They're just in matrix form. Um, and then in this model, those are seen 
those are seen as, so your nodes are your weights and your lines indicate matrix multiplication. So they indicate, um, so your weight is what's multiplying whatever comes into this node. Um, remember we feed X into this node. So it's like M times X. Um, and then that gets output as output. And then that gets fed into another node, which is timed by time multiplied by M4 in our case. And then that output gets multiplied by M3 and that output gets multiplied by M2. Um, so these are all just, it's easier to think of them all, all as matrix multiplications. Um, and then ultimately you, you arrive at um, a classifier, which comes up with a prediction from, from this. Uh, and then CS156A is a great resource to learn more about um, sort of the basics of neural networks and the basics of machine learning. Um, it's totally free and all available on YouTube. Okay, so I'm now getting into um, what a neural network architecture is and the PyTorch code that goes along with it. So a forward model um, is a full pass through this network. Um, so it runs through however many epochs through your full set of data um, and comes up with a prediction from your data. Um, so it goes through the whole network and then comes up with a prediction. And then from these predictions, the loss, remember, is calculated. So you, you take your prediction and you take your ground truth um, and you come up with some metric that is the distance between them. In classification, that's usually cross entropy loss, um, which is like a measure of energy difference um, between the prediction and the class. And then now you have an, a number for how um, well or how poorly you're wasted. Um, and then now you want to like change your weights to make your model better. So the way that you do that is you call back propagation. Um, and that takes the loss and finds out sort of, so back propagates it through the network. So um, and it does this through um, like the chain rule and derivatives. Um, but the the essence of it is um, it takes the loss and then it finds which nodes or which weights most contributed to the loss or um, or least contributed, like helped the loss. Um, and it adjusts the weights so that those those weights who were heavy pen penalizers for the loss um, get reduced uh, or the weights that improved the loss um, get it, it increased. Um, which is, I don't know, it's really, the math behind it is really um, straightforward. Uh, but yeah, the essence of it is it just adjusts the weights by um, trickling it back through the network. And then this is just a cartoon representation. So you have a loss and then you say, how much did this matrix multiplication affect it? Okay, that affected it a lot. So I'm gonna adjust this node to be um, a lower weight. And then how much did this one affect it? Oh, this affected it the most. So I'm gonna reduce this one. How much did this affect it? Oh, that reduced it a lot. So I'm gonna, or that affected it a lot. So I'm gonna reduce this one sort of thing. So now, um, so yeah, you have you have the culprits of of what affected your poor loss, um, and so uh, you want to say, I want to step, I want to move my model to a direction that where it's going to be like a better weight, or in theory, a better to in theory get a better loss, um, and you do this through this optimizer step. Um, so it's usually just taking taking your model and saying, okay, I want to adjust all my weights so that um, they're closer to um, some point that I want to get to. Okay, and so in the optimizer, um, it's so if you look at your whole network space and you think the the you're you're trying to minimize your loss. Remember, so this is a um, picture of like the loss landscape and you want to get to the lowest possible point on this loss landscape. 
um, and your optimizer is a way to do that. Your optimizer says, okay, like, let me take the, the step that will get me a little bit lower um, or tell me that like, I'm, I'm most optimal, I should stop here. Um, and so gradient descent is one way of doing that. Um, it takes a step one lower every time. Um, there's also something called stochastic gradient descent, uh, which adds a little bit of randomness to the gradient descent, which if you look at this diagram, um, you see that there are two little like uh, buckets that the balls could get into. And the optimal bucket is on um, the left, left for me side. Uh, and stochastic gradient descent, essentially, if you think about this as like a table, um, it's a way to sort of like uh, shake the table so that the marbles or the balls that get into the local minima, which is like um, the smaller divot, uh, can shake out and get into the, the actual minimum. Okay, so what is a con convolutional neural, neural network all together? So this is a um, example of each of those, like each layer is one of these. Um, so this is like a layer uh, and each layer could be however large and then they all feed into um, smaller layers or how, however you wanna shape your layers, they all feed into the next layers and then it comes up with a prediction. So, um these these are like convolutional layers um these are layers that do max pooling um and then these are fully connected layers that come up with your um prediction and then the name of this network all, like as yeah the name of this network is called vgg um and then 16 is usually indicates the number of layers so if you have like a resnet 101 you have 101 layers. If you have a ResNet 50, you have 50 layers. Stuff like that. Um, okay, yeah. And then this just refers to um, like the spatial resolution. So how many pixels are in your image? Um, and then this is the, like the number of filters on your image. Um, yeah. Okay. So what deep learning architectures should each task start start out with. If if I was like, okay, I have a classification problem, what do I want to start with um, in terms of architectures? Because there are so many architectures out there. Um, so we recommend that you start with either a ResNet 18, MobileNet, or VGG 16. All of these are fairly small networks. Their performance won't be wonderful, but they'll they'll allow you to iterate really fast. And when you're learning the stuff, it's um, really important to iterate fast just because you want that feedback loop of like, how is how is this tweak doing? How is that tweak doing? All that stuff. Um, so ResNet 18, um, I won't get too much into it, uh, but it was uh, a trick that Kai Ming He found, I think. Um, and it was a way to, um, in, in back propagation, you find the gradients in order to um, shift the weights. And in previous like ConvNet um, problems, uh, the, gra the gradients were approaching zero so that the weights weren't changing. Um, and then like they were maxing out at a network with a, a fewer number of layers. Um, but the Resin 18 um, was able to sort of do a trick with the gradient so that they didn't um, max like get to zero as quickly um, to take advantage of uh, multiple, like having many more layers. And with many more layers now with a ResNet, um, you're typically able to get um, lower error, which is nice. Okay, so in object detection, um, we recommend starting with a YOLO v5 small model. Um, I'll, I'll get into that. Um, so YOLO is a single stage object detector, which means that it goes through all of the data once and comes up with um, 
like box predictions and classes. Um, so it doesn't have to, some object detectors like do two passes through the data, YOLO just, just does once, hence its name, you only look once. Um, it does this by taking an image, um, segmenting it into patches, and then putting an anchor box in each patch, um, and like, or putting several anchor boxes in each patch. Um, so, yeah. And then you predict a score for each box, including if, uh, if it thinks the box is background. And, um, it's able, like, it's able to learn from the patches themselves, and then it combines patches afterwards. And then segmentation, we recommend using a fully connected network um, with a Resin 18 background backbone. Um, you can start with a unit. Units have um, a code base that is readily accessible and fairly easy to implement. Um, a unit's uh, network architecture looks like this. So um, you take an image, starts over here, you go, you like downsize it, um, and then you go back up, hence the U, um, and each pixel will then have, um, it'll be like a class, pixel level class prediction. So like this pixel belongs to a cow, this pixel belongs to a cow, this pixel, pixel belongs to the sky, and so on. Um, it has no dense layers, which means that it has fewer parameters, which means that it has faster training, which remember for us, faster training is um, the name of the game. Like we want to be able to iterate so that we can learn how to move and how, how to analyze our data. And that is it. That's all I have. Um, thanks for listening to me. I hope that it was helpful. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, but yeah, thanks.